joining us, come over to the main stage. We have a great speaker for you guys right now. Uh, like I mentioned, she's been doing conferences all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mara Gordon. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Hi. It's, uh, it's the acoustics in here are interesting, so you can see it. Um, I'm, first of all, I'd like to see a, a, a show of hands for anybody here who has a medical background. Okay. How about government affiliation? Okay. And who here is a patient? Okay. And adult use? Okay. All right. I just want to know who I'm talking to. Yeah, my, my presentation tends to get a little bit technical into the medical, but I would rather err on the side of giving you too much information than uh, trying to gloss over it, so it's not that important. Um, I first started Anzeldas about a little over five years ago. Um, I was a patient and my husband was a patient. My background is I was an engineer. I was a process engineer. So data is kind of my Bible. Everything is numbers, math, understanding things, looking for patterns. And I thought when I first came into this and I saw the way that cannabis was being um, sold and dosed, it made absolutely no sense. I started keeping track of it right away and going, there's got to be a better way. I would buy a, 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 an edible in a, a dispensary, the leading biggest dispensary in the world, and the dosing information was between 5 and 30 doses. Well, what does that mean? If you're dealing with a tiny little brownie, how do you know how to figure that out? They didn't tell you how many milligrams was in it. If it wasn't baked correctly, the outer edges would have less medicine. If it was a brownie from the middle of it, all the medicine would be in the middle brownie. I mean, it was a, it was a crap shoot. We didn't know if I was going to be having nightmares, if I was going to not be able to get up the next morning because I was too sleepy, or if I was going to be up all night wired. And I thought there's got to be a better way. I went up to telling on myself, I went up to Oregon where I knew, I mean at the time I was so super straight, I didn't know anybody in California who used cannabis. And I was like, so I went up to, I knew one person in Oregon that did, and she gave me the grandma discount where I bought two ounces of Triple X Chem Dog. The names were insane. But the medicine was fantastic, and I went back home, and I made myself some infused oil. Uh, I didn't know anything about decarboxylation, I didn't know anything about processing, but I was able to just kind of fake my way through it, and I made some of my Aunt Zelda's carrot cake, which is a very, anyone that's ever made carrot cake will tell you it's very heavy in oil, and so that was where the name originally came from on this. Everybody started talking about my Aunt Zelda's carrot cake, Aunt Zelda's, and it stuck and it became the name of our organization. Um, what I tell people now is that I would rather that they made themselves a piece of carrot cake and ate it alongside their infused, properly dosed medicine. I don't necessarily believe that the medicine belongs in the edible. If you want to have a medicated brownie, take medicine and then eat a brownie. They don't have to be in the same thing together. You cannot really effectively dose unless they're single dose. And even with them, if you don't know the milligrams, you still don't have, you still a crapshoot. I'm hoping this will come back on. Okay. So we're here to talk to you today about the clinical application of cannabinoids and terpenes for chronic illnesses. What we've been doing is we've been collecting the data on what works and what doesn't work for various diseases and looking for patterns in whether it was going to be somebody's age, what they weighed, what their heritage is, what their disease is and everything to kind of come up with some standardizations. And uh, I hope to go through here and at the end I'll try to leave some room for time for questions because I'm sure that there's a lot of patients in this audience so I'm hoping that I'll be able to address some of those questions for you. Okay, the first thing I want to look at is the endocannabinoid. What is a cannabinoid? A cannabinoid is something that activates the, the endocannabinoids or the cannabinoid receptors within your body. The endocannabinoids or the internal cannabinoids are your CB1 and your CB2 receptors. These are the anandamide, 2-AG, and others as well. You have orphan ones like GPR55 that we're still doing research on and other cannabinoids. If you don't have enough of the endo, you can go with exo, 
or external cannabinoids. In this case, they're phyto or plant-based, which is what you have in cannabis. Cannabis activates the, re the, the endocannabinoid or the cannabinoid receptors within your body the same way that the internal ones that are endogenous within your body. If you don't have enough vitamin C in your body, then you'll take a supplement. If you're iron deficient, you'll take iron. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're lacking in vitamin E, you'll take vitamin E. If your endocannabinoid system is deficient, you'd simply take a plant-based, which is a phytocannabinoid or THC. All diseases associated with an endocannabinoid deficiency. Okay, now what is a terpene? I'm going through this very quickly. A terpene is a, uh, what you smell. Uh, when you smell a perfume, when you smell uh, a flower, when you smell uh, lavender and, um, and uh, roses, all these things are terpenes that you smell. You know, anybody that's ever held a cannabis bud, squeezed it and released the terpenes, they're very fragile. You have to be careful how you work with them so that you don't burn them off or that you don't um, overexpose them to the air. But those are, what, those are part of what the medicine is within the cannabis plant. You have uh, alpha pinene is a very common one. It's been associated with everything from alleviating anxiety within PTSD. It has some incredible cancer killing properties potentially. And you have limonene, which is uh, what you have in uh, lemon rind and is, is very uplifting feeling. You know, I was on an airplane uh, recently coming from one of those like 19 hour flights and I was tired and I was cranky and the flight attendant handed me a wet washcloth scented with lemon and I immediately I put it to my face and it was just like <sighs> this overwhelming sense of well-being and calm came over me because of it. It's no different than what they have in cannabis which is why there's such a difference in the, in the plants that you have there. Now you may or may not have ever heard of something called the entourage effect. And what this is, is this is the, basically, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, as Aristotle so well put it so well. And this is where you have the plants, when you have the different cannabinoids and the different terpenes that com in combination, they're far more effective than they are when they're on their own. You don't really have anybody who's going to be addicted to Marinol because Marinol on its own is really pretty awful. Marinol will get rid of some of your nausea and pain, but the, the, the psychoactivity is pretty uncomfortable. It's not mitigated in any way by any other cannabinoids or terpenes like you have in a whole plant, like you would have in a, a whole plant cannabis, where you're going to have a much more beneficial effect from it. So, we like to say the entourage effect, and I, and I use this, this little analogy quite frequently, and people are probably sick of hearing me say it, but I compare it to baking a cake. Um, you bake a cake, you've got, you've got your flour, you've got your sugar, you've got your milk, you've got your butter, you've got your eggs, you've got all these different things. If you put them together and you bake them into a cake, you're going to have a beautiful chocolate cake, assuming you know how to bake. If you just take the flour and you eat it on its own, or if you just take the butter and you eat it on its own, it's going to be disgusting. It's going to be awful. It's not going to have anything that's going to be anything even remotely near a chocolate cake. You cannot sit and eat your flour and eat your butter and eat your eggs and, and think that they're going to mix up somehow and become a chocolate cake within your taste buds. It's the same thing with the entourage effect. Each one of these different cannabinoids, and there's, there's between, depending on who you talk to, there's about 100 cannabinoids and between two and 400 different terpenes. Any of these different combinations that you have are going to create different medicinal effects. So that in essentially, the more we understand it, the more that we understand, the more that we know, you basically have a pharmacy and a bud. The, the, different, the different medicines that potentially, or the different, the different diseases, already there's over 700 diseases and ailments that have been identified that can be uh, affected by the proper cannabis use. Now you have to, it's also a matter of picking the right ones. You want to pick the right combination of cannabinoids and terpenes for the right diseases. The beautiful thing about cannabis, though, is even if you don't pick the right one, the only thing that's going to happen is you're not going to feel so great for a couple hours. Nobody in the known history of, of humanity and the history of cannabis has ever died from too much cannabis or an overdose. And that is, you know, now I did hear about one guy that was killed 
but that's when 50 bales fell on him and crushed him. I don't think that counts. Okay, so I'm going to go very briefly. There's, like I said, there's, a, there's over 100 identified different cannabinoids at this point, and they all start out as the mother compound, which is CBGA. Uh, cannabigerol acid. All the, all, all of the different cannabinoids within cannabis start out with an acid molecule attached. These in the raw, that's why the THCA, for example, if you'll notice. Sorry, the lighting is pretty bad. Well, take my word for it. The THCA and CBDA and CBCA, which is what the first three compounds are that have identified after it goes from the mother compound of this cannabigerol acid, these all have their own medical benefits as well. Um, many, many people who use CBD for epilepsy, the CBD only works for so long before it starts being beneficial and the efficacy decreases. We found that you then put THCA in and it and, and replace it or, or alongside it and it can make all the difference in the world. Dr. William Courtney recommends people juice, you know, the families. We, we actually suggest that people take a bud and not the family, so they don't, there's not as much crystals, there aren't as many terpenes, I mean, and uh, trichomes, excuse me, on the leaves. And we would recommend instead that you either keep it out and do that, or take a bud or a part of a bud a day where you actually know how many milligrams of the major cannabinoids are in them. Of the 13 cannabinoids that are listed on this screen, that you'll just have to trust me, um, six of those have anti-cancer properties within them. So once again, even if you don't use, you know, in my world, it's perfect medicine. In my world, everything's lab tested. I know how many milligrams of every cannabinoid, every terpene. But in the real world, people are growing a plant in their closet. And they, they don't know what's in it. They just, it's a crapshoot. They're hoping. The beauty of it is even if that's the case for you, you still are not going to do harm. And chances are you're going to still have phenomenal medical benefits for your body because there are so many, many compounds within the medicine itself. Our goal within cannabis treatment is always to what cannabis, what the endocannabinoid system is for, and that is to um, have, bring the body to a state of homeostasis or synergy, balance, energy-wise. The, the endocannabinoid system controls so much of what the body's activities are as far as the, the adrenal, the uh, hormones, the, there's so many different systems, and we'll get into that in a minute, that if you have homeostasis, you're going to have an environment where disease is not able to, to, to promulgate very effectively. And so even if you're using something you don't know exactly what it is, there's still going to be benefits to it. Now the endocannabinoid system, as I mentioned earlier, is, is comprised of, you've got your CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. There is some that think that perhaps there's a CB3 receptor, but we, it's yet to be identified. And so until I see the evidence on it, I'm not incorporating anything about that. But the, the CB1 receptors are primarily within your central nervous system in your body, and the CB2 receptors are primarily within your immune system and your peripheral organs. The reason this is important is because when we're creating treatment protocols for patients, we need to know if they're where there is more of a concentration of one uh, cannabinoid receptor over the other. Um, the, for example, uh, CB2 is uh, well, it's associated more with the immune response. Um, Beta-carophylline, which is found in black pepper and cloves and other things, actually is known to be an agonist for the CB2 uh, within your body, CB2 receptors, and activate them. CB1 is very important. There's more of the concentration in the brain so that when you're coming up with treatment protocols, you want to come up with the ones that are going to be most effectively geared towards those receptors. Now, THC, which of course is the activated uh, compound within within cannabis that so many people talk about and you hear all the boogaboos about because of the psychoactivity. Uh, the, the THC actually fits like a key into a lock that opens up and, and activates the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And why that's important is because they start the, they, they start the ball rolling. Your own body, your own natural endocannabinoids, like anandamide and 2A2, do, do the exact same thing. 
they do the exact same thing, which is why when you're properly medicated, there isn't enormous amounts of psychoactivity. You just are going for homeostasis. You're just going for balance and health within the body. So what you're really doing is you're replacing and you're unlocking, you're activating these receptor sites from this external source that is not necessarily available within your own body because you have some sort of deficiency as Dr. Ethan Russo has identified. Being left in the lurch, not having access to medicine that will help them with their diseases because they live in CBD only states or CBD only countries. CBD without the other, any more than you would have THC without the entourage effect, is not going to be a very effective over time because you have to have all the components of the whole plant. Plus the fact that CBD alone, without having some of the least a little microdose of the THC, is still not going to be effective against seizures. Maybe if you're a perfectly healthy person and you hurt your knee playing tennis, you know, you take a little bit of CBD from him as an anti-inflammatory and you'll have some benefit. But other than that, it is absolutely, there's no way that I would recommend it um, as a way to go for any state, country, city, or even anybody treating a loved one. John. So, oh, well, let me finish here for a minute. So CBD is an antagonist for the, for the CB1 receptors and the CB2 receptors. So if you have, let's say you have somebody who you've taken being left in the lurch, not having access to medicine that will help them with their diseases because they live, is not going to be a very effective over time because you have to have all the components of the whole plant. Plus the fact that CBD alone, without having some of the least a little microdose of the THC, is still not going to be effective against seizures. Maybe if you're a perfectly healthy person and you hurt your knee playing tennis, you know, you take a little bit of CBD from him as an anti-inflammatory and you'll have some benefit. But other than that, it is absolutely, there's no way that I would recommend it um, as a way to go for any state, country, city, or even anybody treating a loved one. John. So, oh, well, let me finish here for a minute. So CBD is an antagonist for the, for the CB1 receptors and the CB2 receptors. So if you have, let's say you have somebody who you've taken too much of, uh, of your THC or too much of your thing and you're feeling too much psychoactivity because you've overactivated the CB1 or CB2 receptor sites, or receptors, you can then take a little bit of CBD, which is an antagonist, which will block it and it'll bring you right down. So it's very good for an emergency uh, rescue medicine for any time you've taken too much because you know, a lot of people that use it uh, as an adult use, they don't even understand the concept of using too much. But if you have somebody who's on a very, very high dose uh, cancer regimen, and let's say they didn't understand what they've got, or they don't have lab tests, or they don't know what's in their medicine, and they take it, there's, you might, you're not going to die, but for a few hours you're going to wish you would. Because it is pretty miserable, it's pretty uncomfortable. I took too much, um, it, it, was a, you know, it was a rookie mistake, it was stupid and I paid the price for it. I was getting on an airplane, I was actually coming out of patients at a time. I had a little bit with me and I couldn't fly with it and I didn't measure it and I took a little bit and I took too much. I spent the entire flight from Miami back to California, back to San Francisco with my head between my knees and a cold sweat. I felt so badly for the man in the seat next to me. You know, he was like handing me tissues and little wet ones the whole flight. It was awful and I thought, I will never ever do it again without measuring. Shame on me. Okay, I'm gonna look first here at cancer because um, cancer is, the number is just surpassed heart disease in this country is the number one killer, unfortunately. I mean, everybody has either been touched themselves or a loved one, family member by cancer. So we're looking here at the way that a cancer cell, for the most part, this is a generalization of how it, it, it mutates and proliferates within your body. You have your mutated cell, and they you have uncontrolled proliferation. You have angiogenesis, which is where it creates its own blood supply. And then it continues on, and it breaks off and metastasizes and spreads to another part of the body. Well, existing anti-cancer therapies, such as chemotherapy, are designed to work on proliferating cells. They're designed to work on cells that are, that are proliferating, just like, they're, just like it's shown here. Well, the problem is we also have cells that proliferate and grow our hair. We also have cells that proliferate that help us to digest our food, which is why people go bald and people vomit when they're going through chemotherapy. It's because 
these are it's indiscriminate chemotherapy and how it treats. Well, they can bring in things like Marinol and other drugs to help to with these uh, symptoms. But they could also bring in the whole plant where it can help with not only alleviate some of the hair loss, the anemia, constipation, bone pain, toxicity of the heart, uh, and then of course lack of appetite and whatever. They could even go further though, and if they would incorporate the cannabis and the correct cannabis cannabinoids, terpenes, and the right uh, uh, ratios into the treatment, they also could be stopping the tumor progression itself. So instead of just worrying about the side effects of antiquated treatment protocols, go ahead and give them something that will help to actually kill the cancer cells as well. The evidence has come out of Complutense University in Spain where they have shown, they've done cancer research on glioblastoma uh, uh, brain tumors and shown that THC by itself works pretty well TMZ, which is a common uh, chemotherapy drug that's used for this, not the not the gossip website, and they, they are used. But when they also does pretty good. But when they're done together, there's over 50% more efficacy in the killing of cancer cells when chemotherapy and cannabinoid therapy are done in conjunction with each other. So. What happens when, how does, how does THC or how does cannabis actually kill cancer? This little radiator looking thing up here at the top left, that is uh, the equivalent of a, of, a, of a CB1 or CB2 receptor. When you put the key into the lock, okay, and when you activate those receptors with the cannabinoid like THC, it creates this chemical cascade that results in apopto which results in apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. You actually end up with having these cells just die. Now everything in between, that's for your doctor and the and the scientist to understand into whatever. What matters to you, and what matters to me as an engineer, is that when I put something in at the top, I'm gonna have dead cells on the other end. So you'll say, okay, how does this differ for what happens when cells die from standard chemotherapy? Why is it any different? Well, standard chemotherapy actually uh, involves in cells dying through a process called necrosis. Now, necrosis is indiscriminate in the way that it kills cells. And it, it, it actually, um, I was sitting with Dr. Sanchez who discovered the THC killed cancer cells. And she said, okay, necrosis is like a car accident. It creates all this peripheral damage and everything around it is destroyed and you end up with inflammation in the body. Well, we all know that inflammation is disease. Inflammation, any time you have inflammation, you have a disease state. Anybody's ever um, cut themselves and they see how it puffs up and gets red around that, that's, that's disease. That's the immune response going on that's going nuts trying to fix things. Apoptosis, on the other hand, in this program, uh, suicide, cell death, it's very clean sort of cell death. It, it, it kind of just like shrinks into itself, dissipates, falls apart, the other cells take its place and there's no evidence that it was ever there. It's just gone. We have patients that come to us and they show us, we look at their MRIs, and they have these entire necrotic areas that are causing them so many, so much damage, so much, so many side effects, and so many things. And it's just dead cancer cells. That's all that it is. It's like scarring. And then they have to deal with all the side effects and all the things of having this area. The apoptosis is a very clean death, and your healthy cells just take the place. Now you have certain types of cancers that contain something. This is the ID1. Now with ID1, this is out of the research from Dr. Sean McAllister at Cal, uh, um, uh, he's a phenomenal researcher, and he was showing that when you have ID1 genes are present, when you have uh, cells that proliferate, for example, in fetuses and infants and children, uh, and as you get older, you don't really, you're not supposed to have the ID1 activity the same way. In certain cancers, it's what actually can work on the proliferation of cells and the metastasis. Well, CBD has been found to downregulate the expression of the ID1 gene, which is why certain cancers are actually affected in a positive manner and just cells are destroyed by the CBD. 
The CBD is not working directly on the apoptosis the same way THC does, though there are evidence not to go into now that in some cases, some cancers, it can have an apoptotic effect also, but it's because it blocks and stands in the way of the ID1, which causes the cells to grow and spread. And listed here are some of the cancers that can be more effectively treated with a higher CBD cannabinoid. And even in those cases, though, you still need to have a little bit of the THC, even at a microdose, for apoptosis. So the question right here, and this is the ultimate question, is could cancer be, or excuse me, can cannabis be accurately and consistently dosed? I'm going to try to run things through these pretty quickly because I know you guys have a full day and I don't want to bore you. But what I'm going to show you is some of the ways that the answer is yes. Okay, all cannabis goes from being a general beautiful herbal flower and becomes medicine with the first thing and that's lab testing. You have to have competent lab testing in order to have something that you can accurately dose. This means using something like an HPLC high performance liquid chromatograph in order to test the cannabinoids within the medicine. It has to be HPLC and not gas, just in case you guys are thinking about opening a lab, because gas uses an explosion to, to measure and the act of exploding causes decarboxylation which drops off the acid molecule. So, you, so you'll get a false reading on what your numbers actually are on your medicine. You can use the gas chromatograph for doing terpenes but not for cannabinoids because of this acid molecule. It's, very, it's a very uh, delicate balance on not having it fall off. But for the purpose of this, we're going to be looking at, for, over the next few slides, at two strains that we used together on a couple of these patients. One of them is cherry white, which was a predominantly high THC strain, and ACDC, which is a very well sta standardized high CBD strain. So, I was hoping to see if you guys can see it. So what I'm showing here is in the cherry white, you have about 54 0.7% uh, THC, which means that every gram of the extract contained 546.7 milligrams of THC. Just small, very small amount, only four, uh, four milligrams of CBD within each, within each gram. The ACDC, on the other hand, had 620 milligrams of CBD in each gram and just a small 17 milligrams of THC in the extract itself. So the first thing was we were tre treating a four-year-old here with glioblastoma and her initial target dose, and I want to emphasize here that when I say target dose, that's where we think that we're going to go. We start out with one or two milligrams and we work our way up. You start low, you move slow. You don't start at a, you know, the, one of the worst things you can do to and almost guarantee, or the best thing you can do to guarantee failure with cannabinoid therapy is to try to give somebody a big giant dose right at the beginning. They're going to feel so miserable, they're going to say, forget this, I'm not doing this. You start them low, you help to desensitize them, and you work them up to a therapeutic dose. We standardize our infused oils at approximately 10 milligrams per mil, which is about, so that means you need about three drops for one milligram. Because there are in fact people that take a, a huge amount of time to even get up to one milligram. Hard to believe that when you go out there and you smoke and you feel great, but there are a lot of people out there that have given their, given their choice, they would never come anywhere near cannabis. However, whatever their life experience and their, their illnesses or whatever is happening, they have no choice. This is what's gonna save their life. And so you wanna make it as comfortable as you can for them to acclimate to the medicine. But in this case, you have this little four-year-old girl and she was on 500 milligrams of THC per day and 250 milligrams of CBD per day. We were able to do with the cherry white that I showed you the lab results on the last slide, we were able to figure precisely how much of her dose should be of each one of these given twice a day. So we were able to have it to where she had 0.45 grams of the cherry white each day and to give her the 500 milligrams and 0.2 grams of the ACDC twice a day. Now we recommend that people separate out their majority, their major CBD and their THC by at least two hours because one's an agonist and one's an antagonist of the same receptor sites. And we find that we're able to keep the dose much lower 
when we keep it when we are when we separate them out because the each one is able to have its its day in the sun so to speak the THC was usually given first and two hours later they still work beautifully synergistically but it really makes a big difference on us being able to keep the doses much lower same same two products and this was with an 88 year old man and he was able with the same diagnosis and the same medicines his dose was 75 milligrams of THC and 30 milligrams of CBD and that was all it took for him to get rid of his tumor and to go into full remission. So with the exact same medicine, in his case it was 0.068 grams of the, of the cherry white and 0.024 of the, of the uh, ACDC. So if you, have, if you have lab results and you know how many milligrams or whatever major cannabinoid is within your medicine, you can accurately dose it and measure it so that you can consistently get the same dose over and over and over again. And also, if you know the terpenes and the other cannabinoids, you can recreate the same effect and the same feeling so that you don't have to have it be a crapshoot every time you take your medicine. Now, the glioblastoma here is showing you a chart of just a few of our patients that we've treated with this particular um, diagnosis. And we find that there's a far greater correlation between age than there is by weight. Standard pharmacopoeia wants to have everything be milligrams per kilogram. With cannabis, that's not really, it doesn't work that way. With cannabis, it works much more according to what your age is. Now, granted, I'm talking generalizations. You might have somebody who's 80 years old and they need 500 milligrams. But this is a general trend over many, many years and many hundreds of patients that we've seen that the older you are, the lower the number of cannabinoids that are required. Part of this has to do with the metabolism and other areas that we're not actually quite uh, sure yet. We're just collecting the data. Now, breast cancer, it's a little bit all over because breast cancer is, I mean, is it triple negative? Uh, is it uh, HR, HER2? I mean, what type of breast cancer is it? But here's the range of what some of the breast cancer patients were using uh, as far as cannabinoid totals. Now you had, um, uh, it tends to be closer to a one-to-one -one ratio in general for breast cancers, but if you have one that's ID1 genetic gene involved, then a lot of times you can be a very effective with a higher CBD and lower THC. We're doing, right now, we're doing in vivo studies in Spain with our purple urkel, testing it alongside of a chemotherapy drug, and we've got three sets of, three or five sets of mice. You've got those that are using the purple urkel by itself, those that are using HU210, which is a synthetic THC, those that are using the chemotherapy drug by itself, and then a combination of the chemotherapy drug with the purple article, the chemotherapy drug with the uh, HU210 or on its own. So that we can see how it's gonna be working against each other. Hopefully we'll have some of those initial results available uh, sometime in March. We'll be presenting a workshop at Patients at a Time in April and I'm hoping that we'll be able to report on what our results are at that time. Now epilepsy, I'm just gonna go very quickly through a few of these diseases. It's how, you know, this is the mechanism of action. It's not magic. We, it's not, it, 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 it's magical in the fact that it's out there and it works in so many different things. But the reality is, is we do understand what's actually happening with THC, CBD within the body when you're dealing with uh, epilepsy. And as you can see, this THC activates the receptor sites which, which, which uh, shorts out the calcium ion pump, which is very important when you're dealing with uh, certain types of seizures. Epilepsy is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. Because you have to ask, why does a person have seizures? Why are, they, why are they having epilepsy? Epilepsy is a category of things. Is it because they've had a brain trauma that's caused them? Is it because they have Dravet syndrome? Do they have Lennox-Gastaut? Do they have a tumor? I mean, all these different things will all have epilepsy and they may all be treated differently. But we have like a seven-year-old girl She's taking uh, 250 milligrams of ACDC or 250 milligrams of CBD and only 10.3 milligrams of THC. You take the THC away and she has seizures. Bring it back in, she doesn't. It works for a while and sometimes you have to then change over to the THCA as I mentioned earlier. So to have THCA in your toolbox, you can even take it where you can take a little bit of the bud, put it in a grinder, 
put it in a smoothie or put it in a soup or a salad or whatever. Well, not, you don't want it to be too hot, so you don't want to decarboxylate it. But have it in a raw form, and you can give it alongside the CBD, and it keeps the CBD dose lower. And when it stops working, it reactivates it so that once again, they can start having seizure control. Now, chronic nerve pain. Here's one, it's very clear on how it works. I mean, more people miss work every year from back pain than any other single reason, you know? Um, it's, it's, and if we could get people off of opiates and off of so many opiates and get them reduced, we would solve so many major health problems. I think that one of the wealthiest families in this country are the ones that created OxyContin, and there's a reason for that. Um, and I don't think that we need to help them to get any richer at this point. So it, it, recar it retards the electrochemical reactions of the peripheral name receptors. As I said before, I showed you on the chart, the CB1 receptors are in the central nervous system, and, and, it, and then CB2 are in, uh, around all the things with the immune, and so anytime you have a problem, you have inflammation, and this cannabis is a beautiful, beautiful tool for in against inflammation. It's between 30 and 50 times more effective than hydrocortisone. So I'm going to take you through a patient of ours that came to us with chronic nerve pain. She had not had a good night's sleep in over 20 years. And um, so we started treating her. We started very low as our initial goal, as we always do, of 25 milligrams of THC. And we had come with that with a blue dream, in sorry, a blue dream infused oil that we suggested that she take twice a day. The, the Blue Dream had 11 milligrams per milliliter of, of THC in it, and it had no CBD. So she was taking this, so she was taking approximately 12.5 milligrams twice a day of this, and it didn't even touch her pain in her case. So we then switched her over, we upped it to, moved up to, and we got her to 100 milligrams of THC. We also switched the strain she was using, used something that was more concentrated so that she wouldn't have to use such a large volume of medicine because the whole idea is to use the least possible so that you can have the, as most of a normal life as possible. And who wants to take in huge volumes of infused oils? Now there's a difference between tinctures and infused oils. Tinctures from uh, uh, when you're looking at, at anything with herbal medicine, a tincture is made with alcohol or glycerin and an infusion is made with something else. We use MCT or medium chain dried glyceride only for our THCA and only in limited amounts because it tends to be fragile. We recommend you use an organic olive oil because it's been shown, the, the French did a study that showed that it does an excellent job of taking up the cannabinoids and terpenes when you're processing it. It absorbs them and holds them very well. If you then do have to treat it like it's fragile, the same way you would a fine olive oil or a fine wine. You keep it in a dark, cool place and you'll be fine and it'll last. Also, you shouldn't make too much at a time, you know, give one month at a time so that you can then measure the dose. And so if it's not the right one, you haven't, you aren't stuck with a whole bunch that isn't going to work for somebody. So we had her on this uh, Pepe Le Pew, 100 milligrams, and it was close, but it wasn't quite right. So we decided to incorporate some of the acid, which I said before works fantastically on inflammation as well. So we had her at uh, 30 milligrams of the, uh, there's a mistake here, I'm sorry. It was supposed to say 30 milligrams, the top says 100, but it was 30 milligrams of the THCA. And for that, she was taking 1.79 milliliter, which is just one and three quarter milliliter. Now, an average dropper has approximately uh, 28 to 30 drops, and that's one milliliter. Just so you know, if you take it, you measure on most of them. Now, that they're all different. It has to do with the specific gravity. It has to do with the way that the molecules are attracted to each other. Our oils tend to be extremely pure with no residue, so the drops are smaller than if you have some of these that have plant, uh, um, plant matter left in them. So you're going to have to take, if you're using somebody's medicine where you don't know for sure, you can just measure for yourself. Take a, take a, a beaker that's one milliliter and measure it out and count the drops and so you'll know consistently moving forward how many drops are actually in your milliliter of your medicine. So when we moved her over to the, to the THCA, and then we standardized her dose at the 80 milligrams of THC, and we brought in 60 milligrams of the CBD, 
and we hit pay dirt. That was her. That was her perfect thing. She was able to sleep. She was able to go to work every day. She was able to be a much happier, constructive member of society. And we were able to do this at this time. We were doing it with a strain called XJ13 and Kanatsu Phenotype 4. That doesn't matter so much as that we understand those names help us to understand which lab result to look at and which cannabinoids and terpenes are within that. Unfortunately, the strain names are, can be very misleading because they can be based upon someone's girlfriend's cat. They could be on somebody's, you know, whatever. Somebody can name them what they think is going to be marketable. Those are not, that's not the way to, to name something. But then again, if you've ever looked up how they name a pharmaceutical, it's also kind of a joke. Uh, Viagra, come like Niagara Falls, and that is really how it got its name. I mean, really. So that's not any more uh, official than anything else either. Anyway, so after, you know, when she came back to us, she, we wanted to repeat this. And because we don't just name things high THC or high CBD or Mara's blend or something, we actually authentically give people the name of the medicines is the best that we know them. We had to recreate it to her because we were out of it. So we were able to recreate it with the Pepe Le Pew and a one that we had that was a high CBD called Black Rose. It happens to be very genetically close to the ACDC, but we were able to, as you can see on this one, what the dose was, and then you come over here and you look at the bottom on the other by taking 1.1, 1 1.15, of the Pepe Le Pew, it had the precisely the same effect as it did on the previous medicine. So she was being able to consistently know exactly. And without lab testing, we wouldn't know that. Without lab testing, it would be a crapshoot to know what was in it because the dose is so profoundly different. The one above it, she was taking 4.29 mil. Here she's only taking 1.1 1 .1 mil or 1.2 mil to achieve the same results because of what was in the actual medicine. So hypertension, we know how hypertension works. We know exactly the, the mechanisms of action within the body and how it works. You can see here, I don't need to sit and read it to you. But we had a 57-year-old male that came to us. He was about to have to be forced retirement, disability because of his hypertension was so severe. He was on beta blockers. He was on, um, they had, I had him on such a litany of medications. It was just a whole plethora of drugs and it still wasn't making a difference. When I first met him, I, and I mentioned earlier, we thought he was a narc because his demeanor was so off. It was just off completely. And it turned out it was the beta blockers that, that just had him numbed out completely. So we started him out on our, um, we had at the time our uh, uh, cotton candy diesel. And then the, this was one that was a, a, like a two to one CBD, THC CBD within the same plant itself, within the same oil. And it came out that it was 30 milligrams of THC and 15 was the dose, but it actually ended up being about 13 milligrams, which may not seem like much, but if you're hypersensitive, one or two milligrams can be all the difference in the world. Most of the people here today, that's not gonna make a big difference to you. But to some people, which is why not everybody uses cannabis. Some people, it's just not comfortable for them and they don't wanna be uncomfortable. They just want to treat their disease. They just want to get better. They don't wanna be high. They don't wanna feel disassociative. They don't wanna be sleepy. They don't wanna be stoned. They just wanna be better. Well, anyway, so we were able to, this was the dose. It was a five milliliter at that point of the cotton candy diesel and he was able to remain at work and stop the beta blockers and reduce significantly down to most of his, his uh, uh, medicines for hypertension. Well, like everything else, it ran out. So we had to do it again. Well, this time we had to mix. And in his case, we don't separate them out. We actually mix them together in one compound for him where we were able to mix uh, a strain called cookies and a strain called the ACDC again, we were able to do it in the right ratios because when you have lab results, it's just mathematics, it's just math, it's just numbers in, in understanding. Anyone who's ever taken a math class could figure out a dose, it's not magical. We were able to recreate for him the 30 milligrams of the THC and the 15 milligrams using strains that had similar properties to them in, in, in terpenes as the previous medicine that he had taken. When that was gone, we were able to do the same thing again using, excuse me, using Pepe Le Pew and Swiss Gold. 
So it's, it's, you can be consistent, you can repeat over and over again and get the same results, which is the opposite of, of, of which is actually the definition of insanity. But in this case, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. In this case, you can do it over and over again and get the same results, so, which is what you want. So in this case, this, this gentleman, he's been a patient of ours for about five years now, still working. He's very, he's kept moving up the ladder. He works in Silicon Valley. You know, he's, you know, at first he was scared anybody would know he's on cannabis, you know, afraid for his job. And now he, he, he tweets it from the, from the treetops. So some of the other things, I mean, like I said, there's over 700 diseases and known ailments that cannabis works for. Obviously, I'm not covering them all here. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste, which is all I'm trying to do here. But Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, is a huge problem, not only because it affects so many people, but there's also very, very little that in pharmacology that they have to offer for, uh, for these people, these sufferers. The treatments are horrible. They have these opportunistic infections. They have fissures. They have all sorts of problems as a result often of this disease. So with these cases, we'll work with them. Oh, here was an example of a 54-year-old female that was having 30 milligrams of THC and 15 of CBD. Now, I'll tell you about a patient of ours in, uh, uh, we have a young man who's 27 years old. He has such severe Crohn's disease that he has abscesses all the time down in his, in his anal canal, okay? So we give him most of the medicine sublingually and some of it we put into a, a, a coconut suppository and with the high, with this, more of the CBD medicine and we'll put it in as a, part of it as a suppository and the infections have cleared up and he's going on having a beautiful life. He's a musician. I mean, to see him, he, he, was this, he was emaciatedly skinny when I met him. He's actually started to thrive and starting to put some weight on. His mother and father, have, you know, even though he's a 27-year-old man, his mother and father have had to devote their life to chasing down treatment protocols and something to help their son. And the last time they came, to my, they came over to our office, and his mother gave me this big hug and she said, thank you so much for giving us our lives back because their the whole lives are not devoted to trying to find solutions for their, their son. So and then of course, PTSD. I cannot say enough about what, what cannabinoid therapy can do against PTSD. Dr. Raphael Mishulam talked about the gift of, of this plant, the gift, the ability to forget. You have the the short-term memory within your brain is the acetylcholine process in the brain. THC blocks that. You know, anyone who's ever gotten high or ever used medicated has experienced when you're saying something and you get to the end of the sentence and you can't remember where you were going or what you were talking about and you're like, uh, yeah. Well, that's what's happening is you have the THC blocks the acetylcholine uptake in the brain which is exactly what you want to have happen if you have PTSD. You want to have the ability to forget. You want to have, you know, this, it's like having a switch that's stuck in the fight or flight, like the saber-toothed tiger is coming chasing after you. And that's the way when somebody that has PTSD, that's basically what's happening, is that evolutionary process we have for survival is against when something is in our way. This is what's it's being blocked. Well, the THC will block that, which allows them to calm. We happen to have a remedy for that. It's a supplement that was designed for as a, uh, it actually went through trials for dementia, and it failed the trials, but it was then offered as a supplement. It's called citicoline. We, rec we don't recommend if you have uh, cancer, if you're treating somebody with cancer, or if you have cancer that you use citicoline as a supplement because it does increase and, and expand the, the blood vessels and you, that's the last thing you want to do when you're, when you're treating against cancers. But if you're not, and you can use that and it completely replaces what the THC blocks without causing, putting you into that fight or flight. So you can effectively use cannabinoid therapy and not feel like you're so stupid you can't finish your sentence. Um, which is a, so it's a really handy tool for non-cancer patients. So the um, ADHD is overstimulation and it's known to just kind of bring people to a much calmer, much more focused way when they use this for the same thing, the interruption of the acetylcholine in the brain. Tourette's syndrome, 
same sort of thing. We see it with autism. They can use just a little bit of the THC therapy, just a little tiny bit, and it can bring their focus right back in. Okay, so the last thing, just in conclusion here, I just want to make sure I made these points, that cannabis is far better, is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You don't want to use isolates. You don't want to use, you know, CBD from hemp. You don't want to use a Marinol synthetic. You want to make sure that you use whole plants so that you can have the full entourage effect. Anytime you have a question of this, just picture sitting there eating a, eating a, a, a cup of flour versus eating a whole bud, if you know what I mean, okay? The activation of the endocannabinoid system plays a, plays a significant role in treating a lot more than pain and nausea and cancer and in all diseases. Uh, that it's important that you select the right cannabinoids and terpenes for your treatment. You can dose correctly and consistently. That's the most important message. And then separating the THC and CBD does allow us to keep the doses much lower. Cannabis must be lab tested. I know Hawaii does not have any labs right now. I understand from some of the people I've spoken to that that's being rectified. I, anything that I can do or my organization can do to help that, fantastic because that's what really takes it from being, you know, a, a, a guessing game into being serious medicine that can be dosed, that your doctor can work with you in significantly. And then all most importantly is the bottom one, and that is that we do need more research. We need clinical trials. We need all of these things. They're all wonderful, but in the meantime, we need access, and we need access now because people are dying, and it's time for that to stop. Thank you. So here's my organist, here's our, our people, and some of you may recognize Justin Kander. He's written four books on cancer and cannabis. He works for us, Corey Hunt, co-founder of Illegally Heal, uh, Dr. Joe Goldstrich, our medical director, and the rest of our chemist, my husband, me, et cetera, intern from Costa Rica. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.